Without further ado, uh, we'd love to, when we have somebody from the outside, to give them a great Quicken Loans welcome. So we're going to ask you to stand up, and let's give a round of applause to a 21, a 21 Emmy Award winner. It's 21 Emmy Awards, Mr. Dan Cobb, buddy. Some of you might remember the tsunami that hit in Japan 2011. Uh, it was a big shift in the way we understood tsunami because we'd never seen anything so big before. When it hit, the earth actually turned on its axis. Time slowed down by 1.8 microseconds a day. The entire island moved eight feet. That's big. At the same time, we saw that the Facebook revolution and the social media revolution was starting to take place. And there's a lot to be learned if you take the metaphor. And we're going to go through the metaphor today. Uh, it started for me as uh, I began in my career. I used to stand in front of large groups like this. I started the agency when I was 24 years old. And, and I used to start out by saying, I look around the room, people were whispering, people were kind of talking to each other, and I could tell there was some snickering. And I said, hmm, I know what they're thinking. I'm young, <laughs> and it used to bring such. It used to bring the house down. People don't laugh anymore when I say that, John. <laughs> um, after about 30 years of thinking through what's going on in the industry, I've been after this quest. I know that at least half my advertising budget works. I just don't know which half. Uh, this one's attributed to Henry Ford, based on a quote earlier by John Wanamaker, a retailer who had the more pessimistic version, half full version that said, based on half my advertising is wasted. Uh, I, I'm not looking for the ass, half that's wasted. That's pretty easy to do. I want to find the half of advertising that actually works. And I want to find that, and I've been after it for the last 30 years. We've been working with some really cool brands. I like to think of it as curiosity. It's an obsession to understand, why do these brands succeed? What is it they're doing? And these are some of the brands we've worked with. And, and we've tried things like a TV show. Let's just make a TV show back in the 90s when reality TV wasn't even a thing yet. We made one about a hospital. And, and Hollywood took interest. And we started going out there and doing things. And that's how we ended up with Disney and Warner and doing social. We, we tried an idea of what if we syndicate online, just like you syndicate TV shows, what if we syndicate to influencers content from Hollywood to launch these digital films? And we did it with Hobbit. And we got 300 million page views, 300 million. I remember bragging about 15,000 page views. <laughs> and this thing accelerated. We started learning there's new ways of doing things. So we started studying other guys. Who else out there is doing some really cool things? And the more we looked at it, the more we understood there's a trend here. But it's more than a trend that's recent. If you look at the trend that makes things happen, it's always been there. And there's been a pattern throughout history how good brands get ahead. And so that's what we ended up diving into. So we started trying to understand at each point of the digital chain, of the digital pathway, that customer starting at the top of the funnel, how much impact does match reach have? How much impact does search have? How much at the point of sale? And we started doing data dumps and connecting and, and building platforms around it to understand what works and what doesn't. Then we tied it back to human psychology to understand that. And it came down to this, a really simple answer better brands for a better human condition. When you are a better brand, when you stand for something that matters, Quicken Loans matters. What you stand for matters. Maybe on the inside you get used to it and you're not really excited about it and you don't understand. But when you're on the outside and your guy doesn't come in every day and I see the passion, I see the values, I see what you guys are doing in Detroit, you're changing a city. You are changing a city. Don't take that lightly. Don't take it for granted. Never get used to being great. 
You can always be better and you can always do more, but you are great and there's a little bit more you can go after. There is no surfer saying, I've arrived. These guys are going after the bigger wave and the bigger wave and the bigger wave and they get badder. And when they get bad enough, they turn black. They actually have this saying in um, Hawaii. It's called code black. It's when everybody is supposed to leave the shoreline. Don't even be within a mile of it. That's when the surfers grab their, way, their surfboards and run out into the ocean. Code black. It's when a, when a tsunami hits, an earthquake comes running at you 500 miles an hour. The, 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 a jetliner travels at 500 miles an hour. The shock wave is coming that fast. When it hits the ground, it, the soot comes up, and that becomes a black wave. What is a black wave rider? We're going to talk about that today. There are waves that come in, and they are big, and they change culture. They don't just change business, they change people. And these are the kind of waves we're, t- we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about how we're in the midst of a massive, massive wave coming in. It's not even on us yet. People are talking about Facebook like it's over. It's not over. And we're going to start by going into seven lessons. You get seven free lessons on how to surf a black wave today. So for those of you who want to go out and try it, don't make it your first surfing experience. I've been out there. <laughs> Five-foot waves killed me, so I don't, be careful. It goes back 100 years. This print was done in 1830. Uh, and uh, in, a, in the land of quakes and sirens, people don't run. In Japan, there's always something going on. It's the ring of fire. You know, there's always a siren. There's always something. You know, you ever been in a meeting, and, this, and an alarm goes off, the fire alarm goes off, and you keep working through it and waiting for it to go by, and, or you hide in a closet because you don't want to have to walk out in the street. I've presented through sirens. I presented, I remember an RFP, I was in the middle of a major review, and we were presenting right through the siren, everybody couldn't hear me, I didn't care. So what would happen if you lived in Japan and the siren came again, and you're on the shoreline, and you're not taking seriously what's happening this time? Let's imagine this. Let's imagine you're a captain of a ship. Let's imagine that ship has 10,000 souls on it, just from Detroit. Outside of that, there's even more, maybe 16,000 if you add them all up. And you're the captain of that ship. Many of you are the, the crew that run that ship. You're responsible for these souls. And you know that what happens when a tsunami comes, first there's a plume of smoke that hits the shoreline. And when it hits the shoreline, you know something's coming down, and the sirens start up. And you're the captain looking over that ship edge, and you're wondering, hmm, do I, do I motor into shore and unload the people and get them off? Or do I just blow it off? I just say, I'm anchor in. We're fine, guys. We just got to ride this out. It's probably a little one, like the last three. We, we survived the Internet revolution. Y2K was a joke, remember? <laughs> Who bought a generator? Generator. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I bought a generator. <laughs> Facebook is over. That you know, it came and it went, and you can't make another Facebook, right? I mean, huh, you know, the internet, the, the e-commerce is over. Amazon owns it. It's over. That wave came by, and now we're just going to cruise off those old waves. Well, I'm going to give you the lesson number one of black wave serving. Don't hesitate. Go out to sea. Would you believe that the only way you're going to captain this ship to survive it is by going out to sea? If you go 100 yards out to sea, the shock wave comes under you, and it feels like you hit, hit some rocks maybe a little bit, and then it moves under, and then it hits the shore and goes up and takes out all the other ships that are anchored in. The best way to do it is to go out to sea. What does go out to sea look like? It looks like technology. It looks like innovation. It looks like tomorrow. It looks like being first, disruptive. Don't hesitate. Go out to sea. If you don't, the consequences are dire. Asia Symphony. Wow. How do you get that off the shore? I <laughs> How are you going to how are you going to take your company out of that situation? Once you're there, how far are you going when you missed the window, when you missed the wave, when you missed the opportunity to innovate? It was scary to innovate, but it's scary right now. I'm telling you right now, that's your tsunami. 
We lost half of our television audience over the last decade, guys. Anybody in marketing paying attention? Half. And guess where they're going? By 2021, we're not going to have any millennials watching TV. Oh, yeah, they're watching their TV, but their Amazon or Netflix is plugged in. And guess what? You're not buying any rocket mortgage commercials on Netflix because they're not for sale. It's over. Advertising is at risk. Is advertising dead? That's the question we explored. Is advertising at risk? Absolutely. Let's look at the numbers. It used to take only three weeks to reach 90% of the population. I remember Michigan State, Marketing 101, it takes about three weeks, 150 GRPs. You do it every week, you do your job, you're going to have three weeks, 90% of the population, you got saturation, you're on your way, right? Well, now you got 60% of the population, if you're lucky, at eight weeks, and you'll never get more than 60% altogether. The other 40% is already gone, and more are going by the day. 16% of a brand new neighborhood even has a cable connection. Marketing is changing, guys. Marketing is changing quickly. It costs 10 times the amount to reach a millennial than it does a traditional media buyer watcher. 10 times, because you've got to spend more to get them because they're fragmented and they're everywhere. You've got two marketing budgets, one for your, your uh, older adult, your, your you know, boomers, I'm sorry. But you've got, you got the other budget for the millennials, and you can't chase them anywhere because they got away from advertising. 1,700 banners a month, you see. Who remembers one? Just one. Can someone raise a hand and say you remember one of those 1,700 banner ads you've all seen? <laughs> Me either. So here's the question. A tsunami is coming. Is it possible to surf the tsunami? An average tsunami that hits the city of Japan, those cities in Japan, they were about 30 feet. Garrett McNamara said, I think I can take it. This dude went after a 100-foot wave, and he created a movement. Let's take a look. But guess what? It's cute when you watch a guy go on that wave 50, 60 miles an hour on a surfboard. From far away, it looks pretty cool and cute. But imagine yourself going that fast on a surfboard. You know, when you're, when you're watching a plane fly by, look how slow it goes. <laughs> 500 miles an hour slow. That dude's moving. They can't get close-ups of that. There's no camera to do it. You're on your own out there when you're taking that kind of wave on. Lesson number two, waves come in sets of three. I was out with some pro surfers learning. I was learning kiteboarding on the, on the weekend. And when the wind was down, we'd go to the other side of the sea and we'd actually hit surfs. And uh, in my, my kiteboard pro said, I started headed out in the ocean. He goes, whoa, whoa, cowboy. He said, hey, you just saw a massive wave go by and you think you're going to go out and go out there. That's the first of a set of three. The next two are going to pummel you. What are you thinking? Hang out here with me. And then I'll tell you when you can go. So I learned a little bit about how not to get pummeled. Because the last couple of times I went out, I decided to fight my way through it. And these guys don't. They've got it down. There's three waves. Oh, there's three waves. That's why you can chill and hang loose when you're surfing. So after a 1,000 years of being an agricultural society, a wave hits, the first wave. Now, keep in mind, there was a, there was a story in Japan. And the story went like this. Um, there was a guy who was trying to teach the people and teach them how to save themselves before the tsunami came. And he said, I learned a lot about other waves. And there was a place I heard about in Hawaii before this wave came in. And he said, I need to tell you about it. His name was Toshikata Katata. 
I'll say that three times real fast. But he was teaching the kids of his neighborhood to save, save themselves. Because what had happened in Hawaii, the, there was a wave that came into a town. And it, they didn't have all the technology to see it coming. They're like, wow, that was a big wave. That was kind of crazy. And, and so then another one came in. They said, this is just OK. This is crazy. Let's watch the waves come in. And then next thing you know, the third wave wasn't coming yet, but it was rushing out over the edge of the horizon. You could see the water was just drying up, and the fish started flopping. So all the kids started, people started gathering around, look at the fish flopping. And guess what that is a sign of? That's the sign of the third wave. The third wave came in at 50 feet over the, over the palm trees, and everybody within the town was lost. And that story went down and became one of the stories that saved thousands of lives in the, on the island of Japan because they were aware of the third wave. The third wave is coming. Let me tell you about the second wave. The first wave's a big one. The second wave kind of gathers more momentum from the last wave. We still do industrial, we still build things. The information age now brings us new access to things. Now we don't just want to build things. We want to have connection with relationship. And all this efficiency that was brought in through the industrial age gives us more time to get to know each other, to have relationships, to have time on the computer. We can do new things, but still just the second wave. The third wave. Now it's not just that I have enough time. Now I, I don't want to just watch what the world is doing. I don't just want to watch Henry Ford make something. I don't just want to watch Steve Jobs build some really cool technology and learn about what the world is doing. Now I want to participate. I want my own channel. I want my own news feed. I want my own TV network to broadcast to the world and tell them what I want to tell them because I want influence. I don't just want stuff anymore. I want to make a difference. This is the participation age. It's the age where we all participate. In the first age, there was a, there was a black wave rider we may all know well, Ford. You know the first wave came in this town. It's a Detroit thing. It is. The second wave came in in the information age, and it was very much a West Coast thing. And they still have a lot of dominance today. And guess what? When the move went to the West Coast, Detroit lost a lot of momentum because our, our black wave was fizzling out. There's a new black wave. New black wave was taking place. There's a third wave that's being created by a new type of entrepreneur, and they're still very young. They're college punks, some of them. And they're creating things like Facebook, where it's a social community, where people can interact and make a difference together. Let's talk about the first wave. First wave is about transactions to sell products. This was the, what it was all about. Just to give you a simple idea, it started about 1899 in Detroit at the Packard Motor Company. So the Packard Motor Company was renowned. It was the world's most advanced factory. It was actually, uh, they invented the steering wheel, air conditioning. They invented automatic transmission. Packard was it. They were the quicken of their day. They were it. They were right on in the front of the wave. They were leading the wave. They were the first black wave rider. There was a guy, a little north of here, a little podunk town. And he was, um, he, was he, had a, he had a carriage company. Now, he was no slouch. Billy Durant was the carriage company. He had invented, this, see that spring suspension there? You see it in all your cars? He invented that. He was the guy who created it and distributed it, had distribution outlets across the country. So he was a wealthy man. He had it all, all in his, uh, you know, he had whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. Okay, so these cars are coming in. Rolls Royce is selling a few. Packard's selling a few. The rich guys get them. But everybody still needs a carriage. So we're going to be around. We're going to be fine. As a matter of fact, this is our core business model. And we read in business school, we don't change from the core business model. Buggies. That's what we sell. That's who we are. Don't talk to me about something else. Because I learned I need to stick with my core. All right? Is buggies the core? Let me ask you this. Are mortgages the, co the core of this company? Just a question. So his employees, once he started getting layoffs, started losing business, his employees came to him. And they said, Billy, help us. Save this town. And so Billy said, OK, I'll do something about it. I got a couple guys in the racing industry I like. Let's call a Lewis Chevrolet and 
I, I think he's a pretty cool dude. I think, let's meet with Oldsmobile. He actually invented that assembly line thing that Henry Ford's been going at. And, and maybe we can bring in uh, Oakland because they're, they're a sweet vehicle, which, by the way, became Pontiac. And he said, let's found a company. Let's call it General Motors. That, you know, and, and nine years after Packard, all right, anybody want to start a social media business nine years after Facebook? Want to start an e-commerce retail outlet nine years after Amazon? Okay, nine years. Two weeks later, Henry Ford introduced the Model T. <laughs> Talk about tough times. Within a short time, Henry Ford was running it. He had $100 million was real money back then. And, and GM was still a startup just trying to figure out what they were going to do. Henry Ford, in the Depression, invests in the V8, John. And, and when he told, when the, when the employees came to them and said, hey, I can't build this V8, Henry. The, the, the metal isn't strong enough. Henry Ford said, oh, oh, go invent new metal. OK, whatever you say. And they did. And GM went on to say, let's take that idea, that V8 idea, and let's make it our own, and let's work with Henry Ford and, and, and compete with each other. Now, at the same time, while this is happening, you've got GM now rising even above Henry Ford. Henry Ford started slouching. He started saying, well, I like my Model T. Let's sell them like five years after they're out of date. Let's keep selling Model Ts, because we make good margin on that. People want a high horsepower engine, like Lewis Chevrolet was making, the race car driver. I want one of them, GM. The Packard industry said, hmm. We have our own business model. We have our core. Our core is the luxury vehicle. Our core is not this eight-cylinder nonsense. We've got 12-cylinder, but they're not, you know, they're kind of heavy. They're not real sporty. We don't need that because we compete. We've got a $2,000 car. We don't need those $500 cars. We compete with Rolls-Royce. I mean, we sell more cars than Rolls-Royce does. Why would we bother with this new type of vehicle? We, we compete for the rich. If you want to make yourself rich, serve the poor. Now, Billy Durant, some people don't know who he is. They took the D's off the GM building. I don't know if you knew that. There were D's up in the corner. They used to stand for Billy Durant. Because in, in the Great Depression, he kept investing. He said, this company's in trouble in the 30s. What are we going to do? He was investing. And even one day, he got into a train wreck. And they shut down the stock market because they said, we got to do something uh, we don't know if we're going to survive this with, with Billy Durant gone because he, he runs our economy. And, and the following morning, Billy announces, I'm alive and buying. The stock market goes back again. What's the story here? What's the lesson? It's never too late to innovate. Never too late. There's another story. There's always another wave coming. Do not be a Packard. This is Packard. I was in there. My, uh, my daughter wanted to do, for whatever reason, homecoming photos in the Packard plant. And so we went in there and started taking photos. And we, we found this shot right here. Um, risk. Risk. That was actually there. Sometimes you just got to step it out, guys. You got to go after that wave. You got to grab your board when it says code black, when it's, everybody's running for the hills. You go out to the water. Lesson number three passion beats proof points. Your imperatives. You're right on with your imperatives. If you're not emotional, you're not engaged. If you're not relational, you're not engaged. This consumer is not looking for product proof points. Let's go through the, the transition. In the first wave, it was about transactions to sell product. And people are still in that wave, especially in this town, guys. Especially in this town. I run into it all the time. Thinking about product. Let's go features. ABS brakes, power windows. Anybody excited, emotional about that yet? Now we've moved on to relationships to serve customers because we're on a new level. We're, we've got new things. Everybody's got ABS brakes. Everybody's got power windows. So let's talk about how we get emotional. How does a relationship build? Let's talk about a relationship funnel for your business. I'll start with my wife. My wife is here. She's a business partner with me and founded the company together about 30 years ago. And the way it happened, it went down like this. I basically, I saw a girl. And she was the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, I couldn't do anything about it. And something happened to me that I could never get rid of. And I'm stuck. I can't get off this. I saw a girl. So I feel this feeling. I like her. 
Just can't help that. Can't make it go away. It won't stop. I like her. There's actually a thing in your brain they call oxytocin. For whatever reason, when, you, when a mother has a child, uh, oxytocin is released in your brain, and it builds a bond between the mother and that child that even the father can't have physiologically. It's just something that happens. So that we call this share of heart. Then we kind of justify the whole thing to ourselves. Oh, yeah, she's smart. She likes kids. Yeah, yeah, I think this is right. And so <laughs> it's not the other way, guys. You don't get out a spreadsheet. Let's stop it. You just don't. You, you, that's not how our brain works. Guess what? When you're picking a doctor to save your life, you don't get out a spreadsheet then either. We've done studies, crazy studies, where 70% of the time people choose a doctor because they felt emotionally connected to them. And then ultimately, we have to declare our love. When you share, when you post, when you tell people about your brand, you are committed, you're cemented, your brain cannot let go of that brand because now you're part of that brand. It is part of who you are. Let's talk about the heart of the consumer brain. What goes on inside that thing? All right, there's two sides. We've got the left side, the right side. Now, there's a lot of debate around. It's like a 70-30 split on what goes on in there. But let's, for simplicity's sake, let's talk about it in left and right brain concepts. Your right brain is typically known as the creative, the emotional, the uh, you know, spatial, learning music. music our musicians, the, the band, they're right brainers, absolutely. Left brain is analytical. You can remember things. Wow, I wish I could do that because I'm a right brainer. I can't remember anything. It's your left brain. Now, your left brain, you can test. You can do focus groups. You can understand what the consumer wants. They want ABS brakes. They want power windows. Let's talk about ABS brakes and power windows because that's what the left brain said. What did the right brain say? We don't know. We don't know what it goes on in that crazy place. All right? So we have this thing that comes love, brand love. Coca-Cola has this thing. They call brand love measure. They test it to see where the brand love quotient is at annually. Um, and oxytocin is that release that happens when a brand experiences love with their customer. So on the left side, we have the preferences, the what I want side. And then the right side comes in and says, this is the identity side. This is the who I am side. I, I chose my wife because that's who I am. There are things about her that is me. I just can't identify what that is. But it's the I am part. So these are the two sides that have to come together in order to create that oxytocin release. On the left side, it's features and benefits. On the right side, it's purpose and values. Okay. Now, you might say, what's the most important piece? Because you can't talk about all these things. Uh, I, I've had a 1,000 clients give me this assignment, by the way. Uh, yeah, let's do these six features, those six features. Uh, let's do 12, you know, let's hit all 12 points, and let's do it in a 30-second spot. You got that? All right, just run it as a bullet point. Let's just have bullet lists and make TV commercials like that. All right, we, can't, we have to pick something. Well, it turns out this. 70% of the brain makes choices in consumer uh, side of the, your brain about values. It's all about values. So values come first. Values drive decision making. Values drive that connectivity. Let me give you an example. Maybe you don't believe me. Let's say, imagine, you like the better tasting cola, right? We all like the better tasting cola, we think. Well, it turns out when you ask people which one tastes better, they say Pepsi. But when you ask them which one they taste better when they see a, a, a logo on it, well, now I like Coke. Well, I was wrong. I, it's, I'm a Coke lover. I, you know, yeah, I, I, you must have switched them on me when I wasn't looking because I like Coke better than Pepsi. Why does that happen? It happens because of oxytocin. When you see that logo, there's something that mixes in a concoction in your brain with the taste that says, I feel good because I see that logo. That logo makes me feel something important. That is who I am. That might be what it tastes good, but that's not who I am. Why do we feel this way? It goes back to 1971. It was a time of great distress for our country. We didn't trust our president. We didn't trust each other. We had race riots. Women were in the streets protesting about their rights. There were, there were, there were, there were fights going on. People were crazy. Oh, that was last week. I'm sorry. <laughs> And, and one marketing person, like any one person in this room, like any one person in this room, saw a, a protest and saw a couple people sit down from the opposite sides on a bench and drink a Coke. And brought it back to the office and said, what if? And they made a commercial. 
I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I'd like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. Some of you are old enough. I'm sorry for those who are not. You saw it on Mad Men, probably. So <laughs> that wasn't made for Mad Men. That was a real commercial that we remember as kids. Some of us. Um, so, what is the value of Coke? What's the value of the, the total company versus the logo, the brand? Let's give a, just an example. If this represents the value market cap of the brand, with the logo on, the brand's worth 120 billion dollars. Okay, let's take the logo off for a second. How much is that company worth now? Less than half. So let's take, for example, if you take just the logo itself, it's worth $50 billion without any assets. Imagine if the Quicken logo was worth $50 billion. That's with a B. The logo, they, I mean, can't you just change the color? Let's just change the name. It's a big deal, all right? Why? Oxytocin connection to millions of people. You've got oxytocin in the brain connected to that logo. You can't get rid of that. You're connected. You're emotionally engaged. So one of the vice presidents once said, if you lost everything in a night and Coke went in and somebody went in with just the logo into a bank that could get a loan to rebuild everything from just the logo. So what was the value that drove all this? Refresh the world to inspire moments of optimism and happiness. They weren't confused. They weren't unsure of who they were. They didn't have 15 points to make in every commercial. What commercial can you remember in your head from Coca-Cola over the last 30, 50, whatever years you've been alive? Think of that commercial. Now line it up to that. It's who Coke is. That's why we love Coke, because they stand for something great. They stand for something that matters. They stand for something good. It's all about North Star values. It's easy to make decisions when you know what your values are. Anybody know who Roy Disney is? Only the guy who funded Walt's ideas. How do you buy a house without funding, right? This is the guy who was the banker. Just like you, as a banker. Maybe you don't think of yourselves that way. Roy didn't think of himself that way. He thought of himself as a dreamer. And guess who else dreams? I see dreams here. I see an organization that stands for something. These isms mean something. These are your values. Every, every client, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. Numbers and money follow. They do not lead. Do the right thing. Not only that, it's not about who is right. It's about what is right. We are the they. You see it when you believe it. That's a black wave rider. That's a statement of every black wave rider I've ever studied. It's how they think. It's why they go out there and take on the impossible. Because they're obsessed with finding a better way, my favorite. Lesson four, throttle your sunflower. There was a guy in the co off the coast of Japan in a little island who was a captain, a 60 some odd old captain named Sugawara. So this captain was, uh, Given the alarm, like everybody, he was up on the hill. He was safe where he was at. But he looked at his island, and he realized when the tsunami would come and there were no boats, he realized his island would be cut off from all food, water. They could all die, even if they survived the tsunami. So what did he do? He ran to his boat, and he went out to sea. Because he said, if all the, all the boats are lost, there will be no one to save this island. I need to go into the waves. Sugawara 
got into a little tiny boat with the, big enough to hold 20 people, big enough, named Sunflower. So he gets in his boat and takes off, and the tsunami came a little quicker than he thought it would. Next thing you know, he's rising up on a 50-foot wave in his little sunflower. He saved the island later. He made it over there, and he came back and brought everyone supplies from shore, brought people to their hospitals. Many lives were saved by one man who didn't care about his own need, Billy Durant. He, he could have died rich with his carriage company and sold it off. You know, Billy Durant, Durant died penniless. When it came to his final moment in the, in the Depression, trying to push his way through with the eight-cylinder engine, they didn't have a lot of money, so he put everything he had back into the company to get it through the difficult time and saved the company because few people came to him from Flint and said, save this town. Category creators are those guys, the people who create ideas. They don't just wait for someone else they can follow. They go out and they adventure and they take chances. Category creators are 13% of the Fortune 100, but they create 74% of the growth. There's a category creator. Obviously, we all know. Man is the creator of change in this world. The board got around and said, Steve, that's not a business statement. I don't know if you've been to college. Remember you dropped out? <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. Well, it, business statements are supposed to sound professional. It, you know, get off your Himalayan mountain and start talking like a business guy. And so Steve, by 1997, uh, had been fired because he wasn't professional. And eventually they called him back and said, Steve, we can't figure this thing out without you. If we could, we wouldn't be calling you. Come on back. Eight weeks later, he makes a speech to his company. Would you like to see the speech? Yeah. All right, I'll let you see it. <laughs> to me, marketing's about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. And we're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. No company is. And so we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. The Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect in this area in the last few years. And we need to bring it back. The way to do that is not to talk about speeds and feeds. It's not to talk about MIPS and megahertz. It's not to talk about why we're better than Windows. The best example of all, and, and one of the greatest jobs of, of marketing in the, in the universe has ever seen is Nike. Remember, Nike sells a commodity. They sell shoes. And yet, when you think of Nike, you feel something different than a shoe company. In their ads, as you know, they don't ever talk about the products. They don't ever tell you about their air soles and why they're better than Reebok's air soles. What does Nike do in their advertising? They, they honor great athletes, and they honor great athletics. That's who they are. That's what they are about. Apple spends a fortune on advertising. You'd never know it. <laughs> You'd never know it. Our customers want to know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for. Where do we fit in this world? And what we're about isn't making boxes for people to get their jobs done, although we do that well. We do that better than almost anybody in some cases. But Apple's about something more than that. Apple, at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And we've had the opportunity to work with people like that. We've had an opportunity to work with people like you, with software developers, with customers who have done it in some big and some small ways. And we believe that in this world. People can change it for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. And this was the commercial. There was no computer. There was nothing to announce. If he had a great piece of hardware, I'm sure the board would have forced him to talk about the features and benefits of it. But he didn't have anything like that. So he didn't talk about the company, didn't talk about the benefits. He had a different idea. 
Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. That's advertising. Now, as an advertising executive, this is where I present to my clients often. And they say, great, great, I like it. Now add the part about the PowerPC and its, and its 300 megahertz new Intel processor we've installed. Because that's really a big, big deal. What happens in your mind? What happens to the oxytocin as soon as you do that? People sense selfishness. And they say, I'm not in love. Just not. You're not about me, you're about you. Social media is now scrutinizing you about what you're trying to get from them. Are you using social media to try to get from me? Oh, I, I see that. I smell that. It's a new world. We can't talk to the consumer about speeds and feeds. But guess what? You eventually need to fulfill the story. You can make a promise over here in the identity, the who am I, I am side. But eventually you have to come back and actually prove that you're different and be disruptive. Oh, colorful computer. What a cool idea. All they did was colorize it. Same computer, but everybody got excited. Or a thousand songs in your pocket. Now you're being disruptive and you earned the right because people were expecting it from you. And now the brain is putting it together and saying, oxytocin, I believe in you. I believe in this man eventually. People start believing in the man. He started he start becoming the identity itself. Lesson number five, purpose floats. There's some places when you're under a wave that big, a lot of these guys wear life jackets because you're going 15, 20 feet underwater sometimes, and it's pushing you down. It'd be good to have something that floats. Purpose floats. When you believe in what you're doing and you have meaning and it matters, it really matters that you're going to change the city, you're going to improve your neighborhood, you're going to make it better for the people who live here. If that really matters, you'll always rise to the top. You'll always ascend in the middle of whatever difficulty comes along. And that happens in each one of these successive waves. Let's talk about the different waves. Wave number one, transactions to sell product. Wave number two, relationships to serve consumers, all right? What do you think wave number three is? Well, we're not going to get to that. We'll go to the three. All right, social movements to serve humanity. What do we mean by that? Let's talk about Maslow's hierarchy. Everybody who's been through the, uh, the College 101 consumer psychology remembers this. Maslow, OK. We're not going to talk about Pavlov's dog, but we will talk about Maslow. All right, so in wave number one, we just have these physical needs. We need things. We want things. And we want transactions to sell products. So all we got to do with our product is label it coffee, and, the, and everybody has all the information they need. ABS brakes, power windows. It runs, right? Oh, let's buy it. Good. They, they have coffee. All right, so wave number two, there's tons of coffee out there. And there's lots of options. So now I need to have a relationship with you. Why do you need a relationship? It's coffee. Well, ego needs need, need to be met. Now, belonging needs need to be, be met with, this, with the relationship. What is it the consumer wants next? We've got all these things fulfilled now. Everybody's, hi, how are you? When you come in, 15 flavors of coffee. I know yours is the one with the latte and the extra, you know, drop of caramel in it. I know all about you. Hi, Lisa, how you doing? Frank? Thanks for coming in today. We've got a relationship at Big B, Starbucks, you name it, all right? And the third wave, we want something different. Are you taking care of your workers? My workers, what do you mean by that? What, uh, what about the planet? What are you doing for the planet here at this coffee shop? Because I want to know you're keeping it green. I want to know that you're, you're worried about global warming. I want to know that you care about these things. We sell coffee. <laughs> Purpose. 
People want to have purpose. Actually, Maslow said, I got it wrong. I got it upside down. Because he started studying and said, well, I can't explain. My chart doesn't explain well. Because I've seen that soldiers fall on grenades. That doesn't make any sense. Why would people do that? There are um, people who starve themselves to death and give up on their lives because they have no hope. If you have no purpose, none of the other things work. It's actually the other way around. Purpose is at the top of the chart. Purpose runs everything else. Let's look at it in the marketplace. If you take today's marketplace, just to show you where the wave is coming, today's marketplace, cause is now more important than service. Let me give you an example. This was a study we did for banks. Anybody know any banks? There's a mortgage company, actually. We won't name them. But I remember I was in the room one day in this mortgage company, and they said, uh, I said, you need to be a disruptor. You need to have disruptive technology. And, and, and guy pulls out the newspaper, like uh, Rocket Mortgage? And everybody in the room goes, Rocket Mortgage! <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't name the bank. <laughs> but uh, this is what the consumer wants. They want cause. Now, keep in mind, this is the general market. Second, they want convenience. Third, they want a mobile app. Well, mobile apps are starting to grow. It's something. I don't know. Look at the millennials. Millennials are saying, I want to know what your cause is before I know what your product is. We'll work, work out the product issue later. What do you stand for? 55%. And guess what? I could care less about your service. You got a mobile app? If I, give me the mobile app. I don't have to talk to people because I don't like talking to people. I'm a millennial. I have texting for that. All right? So now it's about the mobile connectivity is the new relationship. Social cause is the new personal service. Let me show you what's going on with some brands we've worked with recently. Okay, so Howie's was kind of flatlined for many years, and then it had an acceleration. It became the fastest same-store sales of any pizza chain. And it did it by changing a few things. Obviously, you can see the logo changed, facades changed, a lot of things changed. So we started studying to find out what was it that caused the massive growth? What was it that made the difference? We asked the consumer, uh, was it the flavored crust that we promote? Was it the 100% uh, was it the 100 mo mozzarella cheese? Because the other guys don't have that. Well, it turns out it was this crazy pink box. People said, number one, the most important th thing to me, Howie's cares. They make pink boxes in October. <laughs> Who saw that coming? It was a neat idea. But now we found that it's actually, there's data behind it. And number two, mozzarella cheese. Number three, flavored crust. Number four, sponsoring school sports is more important than a dollar for salad that normally costs $6. I, I'd rather, you could give them a $6 discount and it won't do as much as helping them with their school. And by the way, pennies going to the Breast, Breast Cancer Awareness Association is much better than a Greek salad that's, that's discounted by like 800%. Okay, that's what you want. We can give it to you. It's a lot cheaper on us to make a difference in the world than to discount our product, so let's do that. Consumer says, yeah, yeah, um, I love buying products when money is being donated to a good cause. I'll have to go order another set of these, those pink brownies. Today, Howie's in the markets it runs, is more, people have more awareness of Howie's as a breast cancer cause than in the National Breast Cancer Foundation, who it funds for doing this program. Crazy. We call it uh, garbage uh, marketing. We, you, we figure that when you're done with your, your uh, box, you stick it out by the trash can. Everybody knows what you eat. You eat Howie's. Simple. Owned media. We think of owned media as something like a social media site. Yeah? You can, you can get really technical. All right, so here's another uh, thing that it does. Because now that I have a relationship with love, I want to download your app. I want to have a relationship with you. Relationship today is no longer human, right? It's digital. That's my relationship with you. Mom, you got an app? Because if not, we're not going to have a relationship. All right? So I just want to repeat my last order. I don't want to have to order again. I don't want to have to get a credit card out. I just want to know I get in there. I'm getting my Howie's rewards. I buy you know, a certain amount of pizza, and you give me something free. Maybe you can do something nice for me. Let's have a relationship. So relationship is still important, but it's very different. Very, very different. The wave has shifted and wrecked everything we thought before. Lesson number six. Don't merely sponsor the movement. Be the movement. All right? So when we see the shoe, we see often it feels, makes you feel, oh, gosh, I have to go exercise. Darn it. I forgot about that. That was this morning. It's this. 
But if you just change something simple, oxytocin release. I see inspiration. It's inspiration and innovation for every athlete in the world. This is what Nike stands for. A guy making shoes with a waffle iron out of the back of his pickup truck builds a company that starts a revolution because it's the end of the innovation age. It's the beginning of something new. Everybody's sedentary. The information age makes us really fat. So we need a revolution. Do something. Anything. <laughs> Okay, so we not only have a revolution with the shoes, we have a re revolution now showing girls doing sports. No one ever saw girls doing sports. It's girls doing sports. What's this about? It's a revolution. We're Nike. We're not about a shoe. We're about changing things. We're about making things normal that weren't. This is, this is black wave surfing. When you look at what they said, oh, we're not about shoes. You think they were a shoe company? No, no, no. We're way up here. We're about innovation and inspiration for every athlete. So that means people want to have a relationship with us. Let's give them technology. Let's give them Nike Plus and have a relationship with them. 28 million people. By the way, marketing directors, he cut his budget in 2006 by 40% out of traditional media and dumped it into creating a competitor to Facebook long after Facebook had won. Interesting. 28 million followers now. I got my Nike Plus right here. All right, so now you have the, the wristband that goes with it and all these different things. You get named Innovator of the Year by Fast Company, and you get now revenue up 70%. Since that bet was taken, the market share went up from 48% to 61%, not even bothering to spend the same level they did on TV like they did in the past. TV is shifting, guys. There's a brand new media. It's not, we are not a TV factory. We are a marketing factory. Factory. We need to think about marketing, and sometimes it's going to mean making stuff like this. So this is the who I am. I'm just do it, but this is what I want. This is who I am now. This is what I want. How are you connecting to me? Earn the right to connect with me because I care about you and I want a relationship. Now come back and connect with me on something that matters. There's no way Adidas will, will close the gap. Adidas remains stuck in the sole of the shoe whereas Nike has engineered a system for the soul of the athlete. Number seven, don't just buy the media, be the media. And this is my last uh, point. This is a real top end idea that's starting to enter the marketplace. Uh, we started doing TV shows for brands in the 90s. And every time we would spend, it was ridiculous. We'd, we'd spend for eight minutes of airtime, we bought a half hour. How do you do that? Great negotiation. No, no, no. Every half hour is paid for by eight minutes of commercials. That's how TV works. So we bought the entire half hour for eight minutes. It was always that amount of money. That's how we did it. So we started getting half hour shows on for different brands. And so don't just buy the media, be the media. Why? Because you have to. Because it used to be in 2012 that it mattered you are on TV. Today it doesn't. For millennials, millennials are already cutting their cables never going to join, never going to be a part of the TV model. As a matter of fact, the cost per thousand in traditional media is almost untenable to reach the millennial now because they're just so rare to actually show up. They're such a small part of your audience. When my daughter left our house, went to college, got married, had two kids, I'm a grandpa, all right? I can, so I can still get the best thing ever. So when, when she comes home, it's the first time she ever sees a TV commercial because she's got Apple TV, she's got Netflix, and she never sees a commercial until she comes home. What do you see when you're a Netflix watcher? What brands show up in your home on your TV set? Not many, but this one does. How does Red Bull show up? Well, somehow they reached 74 on Forbes brand list without doing any TV commercials. Somehow, they make $100 million from their marketing department. The marketing makes money. They actually bill people. People pay to watch Red Bull content. They're advertising. And they sit for a half hour or an hour and give them great reviews. How is this possible? They have their own TV channel? Are you kidding me? Well, it doesn't take much, guys. Frank and I, we were working on TV channels with Microsoft. You can give them away. It's really easy. T 
TV channels are as easy to make today as a website was 10 years ago. It goes right into the home. So Netflix made a TV channel. And guess what their marketing director does to market his product? SVP of monetization. That's the title of the marketing director for Red Bull. Monetization. All right, when are you guys going to start showing your bottom line and not be an expense line item at Quicken Loans? I don't mean show return on investment by the other people selling stuff. What is the product you sell in your department that you make money on? Because you are a media company. Who's stopping you guys? Who said you can't? Where was that rule written? Probably in the same college that Steve Jobs dropped out of. All right? So I'm going to show you a trailer about speed riding. A lot of you actually participate in this sport. And uh, this is part of a series called Unridables. It's the top 1% of our athletes will, will do projects around uh, like this. So this is called speed riding. Tonight at 9 p.m., if you give us 46 minutes of your time, we will show you the whole piece. So boys, roll the tape. Growing up in Alaska, I'd always stare out at the mountains, dreaming of what it would take to ski every single peak. Alaska has been the playground for big mountain skiing and snowboarding for over 20 years. One of the last places in North America where the glaciers still dominate the landscape. inspiration for staying on the ground more and making more aggressive ski turns, you know, really was influenced by Antoine and those boys over there in the Chamonix area that were really opening our eyes to what was possible in the mountains. He had the idea of going to ski somewhere where the best skiers of the world they cannot go. This built something that became speed riding. OK, so when you're Red Bull and you created the content, you own the parachute. You own the helicopter. You own all of it. You're the cool dude who brought all this together that everybody loves. Thank you, Red Bull, because I get to watch this stuff. And by the way, pay $8, $10 a month, get my Amazon Prime, I get to download because you do this for me, and I th I'm thankful for you, because you're a great brand. And I'm not talking hypothetically. I love this content. I'm a, I'm a kiteboarder myself, kind of, just learning that sport, but big into the skateboarding, wakeboarding, all those things. But imagine if you're a guy like me, and you get to watch stuff like this as an advertisement. That's cool. Make a TV commercial cooler than that, and, and I'll pay to see it. The brand is worth $7.9 billion. Just the logo, all right? Again, we don't, don't they make pop or something? I forgot what they make. Don't they make something? A product of some kind. But they actually have more brand value in their logo than they make in revenue for the entire company for the entire year. Let me give you an example. Some people say, well, we know Coke has a purpose. A lot of people have talked this one for years. What's the purpose of Red Bull? Give you wings, letting your dreams come true. This is the participation age. They don't just want relationship. It's great, I want a relationship, happiness, and all that. I want my dreams to come true. I want, I want to participate. I want to be a part of the change. I want to be in the show. I want to carry my own GoPro and, and upload it and let Red Bull talk about me. Because this is the participation age. And not only that, we all get to participate. We all want to be film producers. So why don't we? Why doesn't Microsoft and Amazon make movies? As a matter of fact, Amazon can make movies because uh, if you make movies, 67, some odd thousand million people, right? Again, one out of every four homes in America is watching Amazon and 
Less than that is watching the news. Less than that is watching everything else. And when you own Amazon Prime and you're watching their content, you spend twice as much when you're at Amazon. So why not? So we look at the Amazon model. Amazon spends how much on television? Anybody got any ideas? Take a look at that number. That's got to be a typo. Someone, can you give me the real slide? Because I think that's the wrong, that's a type. No, I'm sorry, just kidding. 2% on TV. 2%. Do you spend 2% of your marketing budget on TV in this room? Just wondering. 2%. Can you even get on TV for 2% of your budget? <laughs> just wondering. You know, 2%, 1% outdoor, 1% on print. What are they spending over here? Well, that 60, that must be digital, right? Let's look at it. Digital is 30%. So they're spending 30% of their budget on digital. What are they spending 66% on? Where's all their money going? They're making movies, guys. They're in Hollywood. They're, they're not making the interruption. They're making the show. And they're bringing people to their content, and that content is selling stuff, and it's working. This is the future of marketing because they're getting cut off. Marketers will not have permission to speak to a consumer who says, I give you no permission. I don't want advertising. I'm done. I'll let you see. I'll, I'll, I'll opt in to some of you based on you proving to me that you have the right values. If you get a couple of rewards with your, your advertising, maybe an Oscar, then I'll watch your advertising. Then, then I'll be interested. Anybody getting Oscars for your, your TV commercials lately? I'm just wondering. Anybody? Because I was want, We are going to have to start getting Oscars for our advertising. All right? We've had 21 Emmys for advertising. Advertising get, doesn't get Emmys. Exactly. Exactly. It's time to start getting in a new space. It's time to go after something new. Who can survive a tsunami? So the story in the book that I write about, um, there was a, a guy, Toshitaka Katara. Okay, he's the guy who I told you about that had discovered all over the world there, was, um, there were tsunamis that came in waves of three. And he talked to these kids in one of the cities. And they, they found in this one city, there was, although 18% of the population was wiped out along the shoreline, there was a school completely devastated. And they said, oh, these kids, oh, no. They said, no, 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 3,000 kids escaped completely. They were the only ones who got out. The kids did. We can't figure it out. So the, the spiritualists came in, and the philosophers came in, and they declared it. Miracle of Tamayashi. They built do documentaries and made movies about them. Heroes of a country. Was this chance, or was there something else? What about this engineer, Toshitaka Katata? What about him? What was he telling these kids? So they started interviewing. They said, oh, it's simple. It came down to, came down to three principles, three simple principles, to survive the participation age, to survive a tsunami. And so what were those three principles? Katata would tell them every time, the same three answers. His first answer, train leaders to follow principles, not pathways. What do you mean, Katata? I mean, the hazard maps, they're, they're no good. As soon as a tsunami comes in that's bigger than last time, it, you may think you're in a safe zone, but you're not. You need to go even farther, even higher. Don't trust hazard maps. Don't trust your media plan from last year. Don't trust the models that work. Don't just GRPs? Are you kidding me? GRPs don't work. They don't matter anymore because we're not reaching 90%. You've got to let the kids have principles. Let leaders have principles, and they will lead. Why? Because they don't have to follow some rule that doesn't make sense anymore. Seven lessons for black wave riding. Don't hesitate. Go out to sea. Waves come in sets of three. Passion beats proof points. Throttle your sunflower. Purpose floats. Don't merely sponsor the movement. Be the movement. Don't just buy the media. Be the media. These are the principles if you're to sur survive the pending wave. And the sirens are sounding. The si we all been to the seminars. Have you changed anything? Are we just buying more social posts with the same dumb thing you're putting on TV? Sorry, did I hurt someone? I, Frank said I could push you. <laughs> I'm guilty of it. Oh, the client says, oh, we don't have budget for that. Use the same asset we put on TV and just repeat it online. And then we'll just, we'll figure it out. Well, we think it's cute. Well, is it cute, but does it work? It looks too professional. The consumer's rejecting it. They're holding their nose because it looks like you used a $500,000 camera on it. They only want stuff coming off an iPhone because otherwise they don't believe it's real. We got to think different. 
Toshitaka said, I told the students they must be brave and be the first ones to evacuate. If you do, others will follow you and you can save their lives too. And that's exactly what happened. The kids not only saved themselves, they saved the teachers who wanted to stop in the safe zone. They said, no, we're not done yet because the principal said. And they moved on with the principals. And the principals brought them to safety. Is this you? Two cars, 2.4 kids, savings account, and a dog. That's what it says. That's what the statistics say you all are, all right? Are you willing to live with that? Are you willing to be another, you know, another person putting a bolt on a car with a lot of rah-rah sessions, but then you go back and put the bolt in the car again the same way we did before at the Packard plant? My only dread is that when I die, I will face the person I could have become. I'm quoting myself there because that's what I'm all, all about when I wrote this book. I said, I got to tell people there's a change coming. I feel crazy. I'm like that crazy guy running in the wilderness saying the sky is falling. But it is. It is. Our media world is shifting and it's not going to last. And you can't just do it with more cool looking memes and social posts. We've got to change the entire model from the ground up. And I think I'm out of time here. So I'm going to leave you with this. Principle number two, I'm not going to tell you about. I'm not going to tell you about principle number three because one of the principles in the book says you need to create conflict and don't resolve it for your viewer. Because if you do, they'll never pick up your book <laughs> and they won't finish reading it. One of the principles that you'll learn inside the book. So thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'll take a chance. Great job.